but uh, we had to postpone the talk uh, last week. Uh, that's coming up soon, so that you'll continue to call that talk 50. So we'll have to give the uh, honor of the 51 to Raghu Kohli. Uh, Raghu Kohli, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us today. Um, it's, it's such a pleasure to invite you in this forum. Uh, Raghu Kohli is a IDC pass out from uh, BC in ni from 1988 batch. Um, and there are a lot of things about Raghu, and I, I don't think I should do that as introduction because his topic itself is uh, the dots of a designer over three decades, where he's actually going to trace the point where he left IDC to where he is today. And actually, it's very interesting to see the kind of things that, uh, at least in that talk that I had with him, is about how things fell in place and one led to the other. And uh, today, I think he's, he's, he's uh, doing a, a very interesting work as part of an uh, investment firm, uh, looking at design as a, a value, uh, how design brings value to the kind of companies that they invest, and he advises them on those, uh, on those propositions. Um, with, that, with that introduction, I know it's very brief, but not to take too much of your time, I'd like to hand over the session to Raghu. Raghu, it's all yours. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, you've been amazingly patient and <clears throat> persevered with me in numerous follow-ups from getting the date to the bio, to the topic, to everything. And thank you very much. It's, uh, it needs somebody like you to make things like this happen. Somebody who is very passionate, somebody who is uh, relentless, uh, that's what it takes to get some good stuff done. And I'm sure a lot of alumni will appreciate your efforts. Thank you so much for this. So when I joined IDC, firstly, I think a warm welcome to many of the friends. I see some old names here, Boban and Deepthi. How nice to see you guys. And Shitish, an old friend and colleague, an amazing set of people, and Umesh and Suresh. I see some familiar names. Good to see you all. No? Uh, so when I joined in IDC in 1986, I think, yeah, around that time, so we had a, on the first week, I think, we had a party for all the freshers in the second floor at the foyer in front of the auditorium. And you had all the faculty members, Professor Nalkani, Professor Rao, Professor Atwankar, Ravi Poya, Keeti Trivedi, Gauri, everybody. Probably, I think all of them have retired by now. So all of them were there. And the students were there. I think at the time, there were about 10, 15 students in senior PD and about the same in junior PD and about 10, I think, in the VC. I think we are the third batch of VC. And in my own batch, there were six or so. In all, about 40 students. There's almost one to four ratio of students to faculty members, which is amazing. And on the party that day, the thing that caught me most was that there is booze, there is music, and there's dancing. And that's when I realized I probably came to a good place, and it leads to doubt. IDC is entirely different than anything I expected from IIT, so I'm in safe zone. Very reassuring, because I just quit my marketing job after four years and joined IDC. Uh, it's a big decision, and many people discourage me from doing it, but I thought that's something fun to do, something which I really wanted to do. And then I knew at that party I was in the right place. And one of the questions that asked all the freshers was that, what do you intend to do after you finish IDC? And we went around asking, uh, everybody was asked that. And I remember my answer at the time was, I wanted to be a corporate identity consultant. And the reason was in my marketing job previously, along with my other stuff, I was also doing uh, brochures and uh, with another agency, exhibitions and stuff like that, just because I was creatively oriented, apparently, according to the rest of the team. Therefore, those tasks were given to me. I was doing that. So I simply extended my past experience uh, to the new role of corporate identity consultant. After IDC, I thought I'd study design, visual communications, and then do this kind of thing in larger companies. That's all I knew about. Uh, little did I know my future is anything but that, everything probably but that, in fact. So. Strange things happen in life, along the course of life, and that's what shapes our course of life, not necessarily the grand plans we make. So today I want to take you through a 
few, I've just taken a few, three or four projects and just go through them and talk about how things led to that and what came out of it, how one thing led to another. And the reason I want to share this with you, we do, is very simple, uh, is that many people, when we go to the universities and make decisions, we imagine a future, like a certain kind of future, and the reality is quite, quite different. And many of us who have spent about 20, 30 years in industry have seen our careers evolve over time. We are all in different positions compared to very different than what we probably had imagined for most of us, if not all of us. Therefore, this journey, I think, is very, very important to, to learn from each other and these insights than actually the technical topics of design and tools and things like that, which we all do in it as a part of the day job. So let me uh, go to a few of these things briefly. Huh? So after the Delft, after them, I, did, I ended up in Delft University in Netherlands as a research fellow in the industrial design department. Um, that was a research fellowship just for six months and somewhere around half a time. And the topic uh, was that uh, studying users in the early phase of design. That was my topic for the research. And somewhere around a couple of months, I gave a presentation and invited various professors to that. And one of the professors who came to the presentation was a guy called late Jim Hennessy. Uh, and in the presentation, he liked the kind of work I was doing. And then he offered me a job soon after the presentation. He said, I'm putting a team together. He just came from University of Washington, Delphi University. He's putting a team together. His interest is to develop tools for designers, tools and techniques for designers. He said, I got this project. I'm putting a team together. Would you like to work with me and help me with this? Uh, I wasn't sure, really, because I studied visual communication. And then somewhere along the course, I'll come to that, I got very interested in human-computer interaction. That's, again, because of a certain moment of serendipity. And then I came to the Delft University to pursue that, to do research in that area. And now here is an opportunity that is coming to do tools for designers, which is not really the topic. And I want to do more UX stuff. And I had a choice of either taking it up or maybe coming back to India as soon after my research fellowship is finished. And I said, OK, what the hell? Let me take this up. So I took it up. And that's a two-year contract for that. So as a that particular team, we had one industrial designer and one computer engineer and me and also one researcher. All of us worked together. And the result of that was this tool called Ideator, which is a sketching device for industrial designers. So what we did there, at least what I did there, my part was essentially understanding how designers sketch. We had hours and hours of video recording, which we analyzed and see the ideation process of designers and develop functionality for a device. And this was the concept device. It is not built, of course. We did prototype the software, the gestures, various pen gestures, and how to do manipulations in the sketches. Uh, but the product itself is just a concept mockup. And we tried to do some of it in Wacom. This is like in 1992. Uh, you have to see the things at the time, 1992. Mobile phones barely existed. Actually, uh, I think Nokia had a very early, big, bulky phone. And we had one email from the entire uh, lab shared by all of us. We didn't even have individual emails at the time. Um, there was no web browser either. It's a very, very different era. There was only one tablet that is possible at the time. That's called a Wacom tablet, which is a black and white screen. Hardcore engineering product, there's not much you can do with it. It's just a screen that's about it. So we, we try to do that use that to prototype some of it. Uh, but the end result of the product is it's only concept. We never patented anything. We never shipped anything. There was no sponsorships for that. But we got a couple of PhDs and master's degrees out of this. Very, very interesting indeed. But it helped me to stay in Holland, this particular project, Anchor Project. Soon after that, um, I thought I'd do a PhD at the university alongside of this project. I started on that, working on design specifications for uh, UX, et cetera. But somehow, I didn't find it interesting enough to, to be pursuing a career in the university. 
So I decided to leave the university and set up my own company, the first, one of the first, I would say, UX design companies in the Netherlands. I set it up in 1994 and ran it for about 10 years. That's a one-person company. So it so happened while I was at the university, I started a portal, in, I think in 1992 or somewhere around that time, called UI World, which is actually resources, which I programmed myself in HTML, HTML3, I think, at the time. Uh, it had resources of all the design schools, the tools designers can use, books designers can read, et cetera, et cetera, all specific to UX. That's why it's called UI World at the time. And again, another moment of serendipity, one day I get an email from a European Commission's officers uh, saying that, can you please post this announcement in your portal? And that's a call, uh, that's, that's an announcement is about a call for proposals. European Commission will explore how technology can help the communities in daily life. So we're inviting research proposals uh, to develop applications for technology very, very broadly. They want to develop a framework for research. I thought that's very interesting. I don't know what fascinated about me then, and, but that's done through large consortiums. So I formed, a, being a one-person company, I formed a consortium with Philips Design at the time and Domus Academy, and we put in a proposal for it and our schema, our research program got selected by that through a competitive process, under which they invited many more proposals to actually execute the projects. So for that, I formed another consortium. I'm still a one-person company. Uh, I went to, at the time, I happened to attend a uh, conference, HCA conference in The Hague. And then I met Bill Morgridge, the late Bill Morgridge, the founder, one of the founders of IDEO London, actually. Uh, so I got in touch with him and said, would IDEO be interested in joining the consortium to execute on this? He said, get in touch with Tim Brown. He is the London office director. Talk to him. And I talked to Tim, and Tim said, mm, kind of will think about it. Not very keen to put our resources into these kind of things. And then also had a couple of contacts with uh, Helsinki, uh, Helsinki University and Vienna University, Dorian, because European consortiums calls for universities and com companies to work together. They give 100% of the cost to the universities, and for the companies, they give 50% of the cost. And me being a company, I will only get 50% of the cost, and I can't afford that. Being a one-person company, I need to have my 100% of the cost covered. So I partnered with the Netherlands Design Institute, who are a non-profit organization. So I became a subcontractor for them, so made a consortium so that I get my 100% through the Netherlands Design Institute. So, so and in the process, when I went to Helsinki, they connected me with Nokia. So we got a contact with Nokia as well, who are also interested in joining. Uh, at the time, Nokia was the king of mobile phones. This Nokia Research Center were doing really cutting edge technology, amazing. Uh, there was a Nokia Communicator as one of the smartphones at the time. Otherwise, all the other phones are just feature phones with black and white screens of four lights. So, and I went back to IDEO and said, look, Nokia is in also. We, need, we really need you, and because Nokia is in, I just said, okay, we are also in, and we had a consortium of six partners with Netherlands Design Institute, the coordinating partner, and I was working with them. So we made a proposal, we got a grant. I think it's about a million euros, I think, that's 1996. It's quite a lot of money at the time for a consortium. And we spent two years on this. Our approach is very simple. It's amazing that European Commission gave us funding for this. Uh, we don't know what is going to come out. We're going to work on this for two years. We're going to really, we're not going to invent any technology. There won't be any patents in that sense. But we really do research on what people want, how people com communicate consumers, and see how technology can help people to communicate and interact with this, and also build strong bonds with, within the local community. That was our thesis, essential proposal. But we laid out a clear process. Six months of research, six months of concepts, about six months of prototyping and testing, and so on and so forth essentially a design thinking process as we call it now. And during the two years, we really, really innovated a number of methods, the role play, the scenarios, uh, the storyboards, uh, a number of number of techniques, in, in fact, at that time. And many of them have become mainstream for design thinking now and developed about 26 different concepts. And we finally prototyped a couple of them. And the final prototype is this, what is, a, what is called as a mobile picture messaging system, I call it the precursor to the uh, mobile phones with the cameras in them, actually. This is a prototype, as you can see. Uh, at the time, remember, there was no even operating. Windows C is in the very early stages. 
there are small cameras, that's about it. Uh, so this prototype was built with actually a laptop, which is carried in a backpack. There's a wire going through. There's a physical model with touch screen, but we had a 360 degree camera. You can do, take selfies as well with that. And you can take pictures and send it to another device. And there's a 9,600 baud modem. And compared to what we have, what three megabytes top load pictures now, that took about roughly about two minutes to three minutes to upload one picture to go send it to another device. And these are the examples of pictures that people took, the kids took. During the testing, we built a couple of these prototypes and handed them over to the families, which they carried them for a week or two weeks, uh, parents, kids, grandparents, whatever, and they took all kinds of pictures. These are the examples of pictures they took. And we even had functionality to annotate them, to put graphics on them, and so on and so forth. That. Fascinating project, fantastic learning indeed. I think we all had about 25 team members across all the companies put together, not full-time, of course, all part-time. We had engineers from Nokia. We had design team from IDEO. We have researchers from Helsinki and uh, Vienna University, and Netherlands, Netherlands Design Institute, and I were doing the methodology and the communications, the project management. Again, a few PhDs and master's thesis came from these projects. Um, there's no direct parent as such, but I think we also published the entire ACM Sikai bulletin of, I think, uh, May 1998 or so. Entire, uh, Interactions magazine was coming from this project, in fact. But the conclusion from this was essentially that people had a need to communicate nonverbal communication, and pictures are a great form to do that. It's basically where it did that particular thesis. And coincidentally or otherwise, Nokia came up with the first phone with a camera only a year, year and a half after this particular project. So when I look back at things, sometimes I do feel like guilty because if you'll see that today, I think people just seem to live living with the pictures and the mobile phones wherever you go. We can't do without that tons and tons of storage just sitting there and people getting addicted to it. I wonder if it's really a good thing. But of course, there's no way to know at that time when we're doing that. We are just ex about thinking about an exciting innovation, exciting future, but never could you really predict how people are going to behave, how when a large scale of adoption comes, the kind of things that happen through technologies like this, which is a humbling experience, I must say, for that. That was about in 1998. But then there's a big project, a couple of years. I think by the end of this, I had a couple of people in my team. That's about it. But it's very difficult to do projects like this as a small company. You know, it takes a long time to make a proposal, and then it takes a long time to execute what we need to think bread and butter day to day. So we thought we'll focus on consulting projects. We did a lot of B2B business applications, and we got a break again through a moment of serendipity with a European parent office. Emphasis is one of the contractors for them, IT contractor, and they got in touch saying that they want UX to sign help. And we worked through them to, with the European parent office. And after seeing the work and the value we added, they decided they need a lot more work. They gave a global tender for UX design services. And my firm of me and a couple of other people, we won the tender, global tender, even against IBM, in fact, at the time. And we got it. We were working with them for about two years. Now, the challenge with the European Parent Office is very interesting. It's a large organization, The Hague in, uh, in the Netherlands, as well as in Germany, in Munich, about thousands of people working. They work with legacy systems. So we're talking about this in 2000, 2001, 2002, early 2000, those areas. They've got multiple IT departments working on the systems. And, and the eight, all the officers, they use these applications morning till evening, eight hours a day. And it's a very critical, mission critical business application for that. And these systems often, they did not talk to each other. Remember those days, there's no cloud. They have servers, physical servers sitting here and there. And there's no design team either in there. And it's a very, very process-driven organization. There's a lot of compliance requirements as well. Okay, so the challenge here is the training, pretty much, with that. So the legacy systems, there's not much you can actually do because the business processes are so complex, they really cannot make any kind of changes in that. And we're talking about at least the most, um, they're using early versions of so with all the constraints, we've developed a sort of guideline, very specific design guideline for European Patent Office and migrated all the things, um, all the systems into that over a couple of years' time. 
At the end of it, uh, we also did a usability test for the systems and the user service to see if it's really had an impact on the learning, performance, and productivity. And of course, we had pretty decent scores on that by the end of this. Quite a large, complex project, I must say. So, and after that, say the second tender came about and uh, more service providers were there. But this time, it's a kind of framework contract. That means it's not a single project, but we are sort of the preferred vendors, so to say, which will provide services to the company. And they will hire people from time to time based on their needs. That was an interesting arrangement. But a year after that, there was much, much less work to be done at the European Parent Office between the three providers. So our kind of work stream kind of dried up, I would say. And because we're so busy doing this project, pure play UX company, so we sort of look down upon web design and say that's for graphic designers. We are you know, UX designers, so we'll be doing complex business applications. I must say a bit of perhaps an arrogance, perhaps, or a bit of whatever it is. So we did pay a price for that. So we didn't have much work. So at the end of it, I decided to basically, you know, it is very unsustainable to do this. So we decided to close down the company, in fact. So all our team members uh, were placed in other companies within a month. And I pretty much took a year off of sorts, doing all kinds of things, uh, traveling and doing various courses, mountaineering, paragliding, all kinds of things to kind of reflect upon life. A few other things happened in my private life at the time also. So the net result of all of that is basically I decided to leave Holland and relocate back to Asia. Really. So that's almost the 90s till mid 2000 is it? one first 15 is almost one particular chapter of my life. So fast forward, I'll cut the short story short, fast forward a few years down the line. And I, I'm missing, of course, I'm leaving out all the juicy bits of in between and some stint in Auroville, some, um, some uh, a year spent in Korea teaching at the design school and many other things. Uh, but eventually, I, I joined a firm called IMRB, which is called Kantar now, uh, which is the largest, one of the largest market research companies in India, as probably you know. And they have a small uh, unit called Innovation Labs, have a small team of people. The idea is to provide, uh, develop uh, product concepts for Indian brands based on the research that the company does using design thinking and innovation techniques. That's broadly the mandate for that. So uh, looking at the team and the company, of course, the company like that is a very strong, excellent market research company. Um, it's been there for many, many years, very good team and all that. But innovation is just not part of the DNA, and neither is design or design, design thinking part of the firm. So we are a small sort of outlier unit within the firm to be able to do this to our clients, but we had to work together with other teams to be able to do this. And we did that. I rebranded the, uh, the unit to Live Labs and revamped the team. We got an amazing set of people in there. And we got a break. We worked with clients like Philips, uh, Samsung, Bosch, PepsiCo, Himalaya, and others. Uh, interesting work indeed, but extremely tough to break into the Indian market with design thinking and innovation services. One of the projects we worked with for a um, top uh, MNC brand in India. And the brief here is to design stack products for the consumers. And this is something, you know, I have a background in visual communications and UX design. I'm a specialist in UX design. What do I know about food design? Absolutely near zero in a way. But the client has a very strong, you know, strong relationship with the client. So, and client wanted to do this. So the firm said we need to support them in this process. So after a lot of back and forth, we decided to take it up actually. And we kind of uh, redesigned the project in a way that we actually do research on people uh, what we did was we actually collected samples of the stack products from all over the country, analyzed them for shapes, sizes, colors, uh, contents, taste, all kinds of things. And the firm already had an excellent a taste palette of India from all the states. Um, and, and we backed them with this stuff. And eventually we came up with an interesting strategy or a framework for developing a number of innovative concepts. I think we got some 16, 17 concepts from the framework and we hired a chef, a very famous chef, to actually prototype these um, food concepts in the lab. And then tested these with the focus groups to see how people rate them for the taste and look and feel and other parameters for that. 
Um, the concept itself is interesting because food is a very, very, you know, palate thing, taste thing. People are very conservative in terms of taste. But at the same time, people are also trying out new kinds of food like pizzas, burgers, wraps, and things like that. So our framework kind of utilized sort of keep the flavors of the food same, somewhat same, close to the Indian palate, but experiment with the forms, shapes, and some other concepts, you know, sort of fusion concepts of sorts. Uh, so these are some of the examples we did from that. Uh, this products, none of these products I ever made it to the market to the best of my knowledge after this is over. Uh, they did evaluate some of them for manufacturing, production, all that. I don't know what would happen afterwards. As a consultant, that's one thing, one of the uh, professional hazards of being a consultant, I would say, is that you do a project, you work for a few months, you give the delivery rules, and you walk away to the next projects. And up, up to the company to take them, produce them, implement them, you really don't know what changes happen along the way and what eventually comes or not. A client is not, not obliged to give you any information on that. And this is one of those such projects. Very learning, great learning experience. It's very challenging, very tough to do, but outcomes are unknown. Uh, soon after that, um, I got another serendipity break of sorts to I joined a company called Leapfrog, and that's a firm I've been with for the last six years or so. It's an impact investment firm, which means they invest in companies which are providing social impact, essentially financial services and healthcare services to low-income groups in Africa and Asia. These are hospitals, diagnostic centers, pharmacy chains, et cetera, and healthcare, and microfinance, insurance companies, and banks and payments companies in the financial services. Uh, this is indeed another interesting experience. Firstly, um, the reason why should they have somebody of my profile in investment company is that they wanted to understand, since they're a social impact investment, they felt they need to understand the consumers better in order to uh, develop growth strategies for the companies and create value during the investment period. And that is the reason for hiring a specialist like me. But apart from it, typical investment firm has mostly MBAs, hardcore finance guys, pretty much that's a team. And little do they know about customers, uh, customer research, not design or research things. Innovation is also not really part of the DNA. It's really investment firms, excellent investment firms, typically. So there's no process in place, how to integrate, what my role is, how it's defined, what is done, et cetera. But interesting, on the first day, I happened to go to Singapore, and that's the annual retreat of the company. So I directly went into the annual retreat. I didn't even go to the office. The entire company is there, about 60, 70 people with the founders, two days. Um, and we had uh, all kinds of sessions with that. And during the two days, one of the partners came to me and said, look, we're going to looking at a company investment firm. We're going to look at a, investing in a company in uh, Kenya, a pharmacy chain. Uh, can you just, you know, talk to the customers and tell us how they feel about the company, pretty much. That's pretty much the briefing I have. I said, okay, fine, we'll do that. So the next week, I didn't even go to the office. I was on a plane to Kenya to do what they call now as, what is actually later on I figured out, it's called as due diligence. Before investing in a company, you look at the financial health of the company, the commercial, legal, all kinds of aspect. And <clears throat> my role is to look at the customers and the products and say, look, are the customers, what are the needs? Are the company meeting the needs of the customers? Are there any gaps in the products? And how can these products grow further during an investment period of four to five years? That's sort of the due diligence yeah, before the investment. So I got into the field for a week. <clears throat> I was in Nairobi, um, interviewed some customers with a local interpreter and understood where the pain points are and kind of made a report of, you know, what's the issues and what the company is solving, where the opportunities are, and that sort of became a template for the rest of the diligences at all. Uh, since then, till over several years, almost all investments we made in the consumer companies have done due diligences for that. That's one of the areas. But in addition to that, I also work with the actually management teams of the portfolio companies. We've got lots of them. Um, <clears throat> I work with them to actually develop growth strategies based on consumers understanding uh, the product mix as well as also the new digital products for some of the consumers in some markets 
So I want to share with you one example of this. This is one of the many examples. So this is a product uh, done for micro insurance company in Ghana. It's a funeral insurance. In Ghana, like in India, weddings are very expensive. In Ghana, funerals are very expensive. Somebody passes away, uh, the, the body is put in a storage of sorts. And after three months, the ceremony takes place, the burial ceremony. During three months, the entire family, extended family gets together. They collect money, they have an organizing committee, and they organize a number of events, and eventually the ceremony takes place. It's very, very expensive business. Therefore, funeral insurance is one of the most popular products in Ghana. This is for mainstream consumers. That means you pay a year, and up to eight members in the family are insured. If any of them are passes away, there's a funeral expense that is covered up to a certain amount by the insurance company. That's essentially the product. But now the company wants to launch an insurance for small uh, informal sector. That means insurance is very small, one or two dollars a month. It covers for the next 30 days and you keep paying at 30 days at a stretch. Every month you have to keep paying for that and a certain amount is covered for that. And this is to be done entirely through mobile phone uh, using USSD in Ghana. Most of the phones are featured phones, very few smartphones. And USSD is extremely popular. People are quite familiar with it. They make all kinds of payments, uh, transfers, et cetera, using USSD interface, which is a short course on the future form. This company already launched the product. It's been there for about a couple of years. They barely had about 6,000 or 7,000 users. And there's a lot of challenges in using the product and also technical challenges of making it work. So we did research and found out what are the challenges with that with a local design team and went through the usual design process. So we've done entire flows, the UX design. Here are some examples. You see extremely simple screens. It's basically, you know, you type in the numbers, one, two, three, four menu items, and you drill down, et cetera, and relaunched it. And since that time, um, the company has 30% of the total client from the company are for this particular product, and there's a huge revenue contributor to the company. They've added, on an average, almost about 20,000 users, I believe, a month or so since the launch of it, and quite a successful product. And not only is it successful commercially, but also it's got the reputation in the market as one of the innovators in digital service in the market for Ghana. Amazing experience. And we continue to innovate this. Uh, uh, recently, we found out some payments are coming, uh, not happening every month. We did the research and found out most uh, the system is hitting the wallet between 20th of the month to 30th of the month. In the research, we found some other people get after the 30th, end of the first, second, or third, they get the money. By changing the date from 20th of the month till the fifth of the next month, we improved the collections by about 7% or so. So it's like the minute tweaks like this based on the real data innovations are going on and, and it's highly impactful product for the business for that. And there are many more such examples in that. So what is common between all these things? I think that's the interesting part. I've been asking myself that. So if you look at the Ideator, which is a research project in the Delft, or the Maple, which is a research product in the commercial environment, or the European Parent Office, or the food products, or this, between all of them. They're all, and there are many more such things, of course. Uh, they, here I've taken only a few of these. If you really connect them, are there any real connections at all? Or are they just disjointed dots of my career journey. And probably I'm not sure if there's a strong connection, but there's certainly some strands I see. And I want to share them with you a bit. One of them is unfamiliar domain. If there's one thing common between all of them, perhaps, you know, every one of them is unfair. If you look at the first one, the sketching device, I'm a visual designer in a way, um, and I wanted to study human computer interaction. And suddenly you're dealing with a device and experience of a device and the functionality of a device and not the industrial design, of course, but much more than that. That's a very, very new domain. We're prototyping this. How do you prototype this? How do you test that with the users with challenges? In the case of Maple, we absolutely had no clue what the product is. You're just starting ground up with a, it's a really a, what I call a greenfield research of sorts, starting with the users, understanding where the pain points are, and coming up with entirely new products which don't exist in the market of sorts. In the case of European Parent Office, yes, it's definitely UX, something area, but with a lot of constraints and extremely mission critical application and highly complex processes. Again, an unknown for a small firm of a couple of people 
We've never done any such things before in the life. And the last one, the food one, is again entirely different domain. Uh, food products, nothing to do with the user experience, not UX, not design even for that matter, I would say. But we did use our design thinking methodology to innovate in that. So like this, in each of them, uh, domains have been rather unfamiliar, un unfamiliar domains. So when you jump into the domain and use the techniques, you know you're able to come up with, with the solutions. Some of them are successful. I will come to that, what I mean by success or failure. It's a different story. But there's always an end result, tangible end results, I would say with that. And the second one is, I think that is one thing that's strong and that goes across all this is the customer centricity. In all these projects, invariably, the starting point has always been a customer, or if there's a product, extensive interactions with the customers to actually understand the issues and improve upon. And that is a driver for the design. And customer insights have been really the driver for the design for all this stuff. And that goes back to the pivotal point of my life. When I was at IDC, my final year master's thesis was called Task-Based Information Design. And I was fortunate to have Professor Atlankar as my guide, which is, again, very unusual for a VC student to have an industrial design professor as a guide. And it's him, I think, who has been, I would say, the most single influential person in my life who introduced me to the concept of customers first. We would happily design things that would say, who is this for? Why would they want to use your product? What's the motivation for them? If you understand that, you can make better products, pretty much. And that is what turned into the customer centricity has been the mantra of my life all over the three decades. And I must say that particular direction is given. Uh, it served me very well. I made a good living for more than three decades, and I'm still making a good living out of the core notion of customer centricity, which I got it to Professor Atwankar at the design school. More than any of the design techniques, of course, we spent, labored many, many hours uh, cutting and pasting typography, you know, typesetting and cutting and pasting all the stuff with a ruler. I could never draw anything straight. I was miserable in terms of computer illustrations. Uh, so in that kind of environment where, uh, where I was not a skilled designer by traditional means at all, but this particular direction I got from Professor Atwankar kind of changed substantially my trajectory entire trajectory and put me into an entirely different track than what I thought I would be, which is a corporate identity consultant extending my past with that. The last one I want to talk about was impact. Now, impact is partly to do with success failure, but impact is beyond success and failure too. How do you measure a success and failure of the work you do? Uh, that depends on what you do. That depends on who you compare with. Many designers are very happy winning awards, competitions, awards, recognition. Okay, that's definitely a success for some. No question about it. Some people are happy learning new things. That's also success. Some people are happy if they make money in the project. That's also fine, too. So how do you define a success and a failure for the project? And after initially, I thought if I do a deliverable on time within the budget, it was successful that there's an output, we manage the project very well. But that is merely an output, that's not the outcome. Over the last few years, particularly after having worked with LeapFrog, I realized the outcomes are impact. Impact means not just social impact, but also impact on the business. How did the work you did contribute to the overall business in a way? So if you work on a project as a designer, you do a PPT, you do a specification, you do a prototype, whatever it is, outcome of it, by the end of the day, where that's implemented and it ships, when the customers buy it and use it, and how, what is the impact on the customer's life as well as the business? Did it contribute to the top line? Did it contribute to the bottom line? Did it contribute to the brand recognition? And how do the customers rate this particular product or experience? And how does that impact in their lives? To me, that is the ultimate measure of a success for a design. Also, design is just one small part of it. I think we designers and design community tend to think of, often talk about design as the starting, middle, and end of the world. But uh, it's far, far from the truth. Design is just one element, and designers are one of the many hundreds and thousands of people which work towards the product. When something is successful in the market, the thousands and hundreds of people contribute to it, and design is just one of the many elements to that, and not the only element. And 
behind every successful product, uh, there might be a design, but also bad design still sells. And we look around us, we're still buying many products which are not great design, but we still buy it because we need it. And there's no other alternative for that. So I think if I have to share a couple of nuggets with, with all of you is that one, if you're thinking of the future, it's the moments of serendipity that lead us to unknown journeys. And often when we have to make decisions, I would say if, if, if there's a probability to fail, probably that's a good decision. There must be a reasonable probability to fail. Let's say there's 60% chance of failing, that probably we're making a good decision. And if we're making a decision which guarantees success, I'm not sure if that's a good decision. I'm not even sure that we'll succeed in that. It's the ability to fail. Uh, it's the probability of failure, I would say, not guaranteed failure, but the probability of failure leads us to be on our toes, to try everything that we can do, and we'll innovate and actually overcome those limits. And when we succeed, it's by huge magnitude of order compared to less risky options of sorts. And in terms of our, many of us are senior designers who are on this call, I think we need to look at, instead of trying to sell the design, we need to look at what is the impact of the design on the business or the society. That is what is meaningful to us. That is what is purposeful to us. And we can quantify this and measure this. There are many, many ways to do that. I think McKinsey recently has done a terrific job for the value of the design publication and a lot of awareness in the businesses as well. So I would say, uh, when we talk about things, we should not be talking about design, we should be talking about what that means to an organization, what can be achieved, what are the results, and design is just one of the many levers to achieve that, nothing more than that. Therefore, often designers need to really fill up bigger shoes and broaden the roles and look at a more strategic view of the products and the services that the company is making. But also, as I said, hundreds and thousands of people involved and different specialties involved, we have to learn to communicate and work with them better. Ultimately, if you want a product to succeed, uh, it's the ability to work with other people that leads us to succeed, not just great design by itself. And I'm sure many of you, uh, if you reflect back in, the, in your life, you will have similar kind of insights and learnings from that, uh, from your journeys as well. And I would be delighted to hear from you about your experience as well. Uh, thank you. I'll pause at this point and let you guys share your experiences as well. Over to Ravi. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi, so much. And uh, certainly, not only you gave us a, a tour of tour of the serendipity that led to many things, but also summarized so so beautifully, uh, uh, especially in terms of the. Uh, collaboration, which is so key for designers, and also seeing designers one of the one of the parts of the larger system. I mean, I think a lot of us can relate that. And, and amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, Raghu. And uh, let's open the forum for questions. Please uh, uh, press the the uh, hand button on for the, so that I know who is on queue. And here is Ganesh. Ganesh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ravi. Uh, Raghu, uh, <clears throat> although you said uh, you uh, presented a dot, but we indeed could see a very beautiful picture out of that uh, <laughs> about your journey. So <clears throat> it's great. I have a question about your food uh, project and uh, wanted to know what was the main design contribution there? In uh, Was it the aesthetics of that food or is it the recipe itself or what? What was the key uh, key brief and contribution as a designer in that project? Sorry if I have missed it. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's a great question. That so, <clears throat> I think the contribution there is essentially the design concept. We developed a framework based on the research insights to have how did we arrive at the conclusion that it is a fusion. And as I said there's a framework which I can't share that for confidential reasons. Uh, which led us to about 16 different permutations and combinations of products. And that's actually a formula they can use to generate many more products indeed. So that is the framework. And we validated that framework by collecting about a dozen of those products, which have been prototyped, which actually the 
preparation of the prototypes are done by the chef himself. You know, uh, so he's expert in the food and all that. But actually, we said no. This needs to have shapes like this, or it needs to have these kind of flavors, or it needs to have this kind of combination. You know, things like that. that's what came from the framework, and also validating testing of the concepts as well. That's also part of the designer's job: the research, the concept, the design concept for the framework. And the testing is what the contributions from the team is. And of course, managing the entire innovation process. Thank you. Thank you. I was, uh, uh, you know, if Ravi, I have a minute. I want to share one of my experiences there. And it is about my uh, farming experience. And uh, I tried to grow pomegranates. And uh, I didn't use any growth uh, accelerators or any kind of pesticides or fertilizers and as a result the fruits were not very beautiful they were not bright in color and <clears throat> their taste was not too sweet so uh, it failed miserably actually i could not sell any of that so uh, you know the notion i developed is uh, for the purpose of making the food aesthetic uh, as a designer, if given a choice, uh, how much we should, uh, you know, contribute to aesthetics of food as a designer is, is a question I wanted to, you know, because uh, if you look at the foods in the market, fruits, those are very bright, big and fat are usually most of it is water and it has a lot of uh, other chemicals which might not be necessarily good for the body. So when I go to market, I usually buy the foods which uh, do not look very beautiful because you can guarantee that they haven't got any growth or, you know, those kind of uh, harmful ingredients. And so I was uh, wondering whether as a designer working in a food domain, should we really try to make them more aesthetics? Aesthetic. Uh that's not a question I would answer. That would not be my approach. I would look at the business. What is the business strategy? What is the end customer? And you know, what are we trying to do with the end customer? What is the value that we provide? Are we providing nutrition for them? Are we providing it just a pleasure? For example, the Japanese uh, cucumbers, which go, which go in square shapes, for example, you know, those kind of things. So what is the value your pro customers want? What is the value you're providing? And what is the solution? If part of that value proposition is aesthetics, and what's the best way to do that? That's, that's, and is it viable, et cetera, et cetera. That's a track I would take. If it's a nutrition or something else, then probably aesthetics may be second criteria. It may not be the most important criteria. No, it depends. So I will not be able to answer that question in a micro like that. It needs to form part of the strategy of the business. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu. Uh, Suresh, go ahead. Suresh Chandrasekhar. Suresh? You need to unmute. Uh, hi, Raghu. This is Suresh. How hey, are you? Echo. Good, to, good to hear you. Uh, okay. Well, one, one small part you missed, which I would be interested to know. How was your experience between uh, IDC and Delph? How was that? And what was that? If I may ask. It's, it's not comparisons. <laughs> uh, well, um, I suppose you mean as a design school, or what do you mean by? What? Okay, there were two. I mean, one is the time in between. How how you uh, when you left IDC and before you joined Delp, how was it, and what did you do? How was that experience? Uh, what okay. you so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Well, okay, that's interesting. One of the fillers. So it's about a year and a half gap of sorts. So I was uh, I was in Delhi actually for a year during that time. Well, that's again another moment of serendipity. My life seems to be full of them for some reason. So one day in IDC, and I, one of the guest houses, one guy called um, came from uh, UDI Yellow Pages at the time. I forget his name. Um, uh, so he was the CEO of that. He came to give a talk or something, and we having lunch there. Something we chat, kept chatting, and he said, "Can you help me with this?" So they're doing UDI Yellow Pages. You know, is they have a directory there, and we have this 300, 300 400 uh, thousands of categories. Can you do research and figure out what categories do people want? That was the kind of question. 
Then I made a proposal to him, and he gave me an engagement. So I moved to Delhi, spent a year there, and did a couple of projects. One of them is this, UDI Yellow Pages Research, and designed the index pages. And the second one also, I happened to get an engagement. I went to one exhibition there, some computer exhibition. I saw one computer systems called EV computer systems. They do software, Mac software developers. The only Mac software developers in India in that time, 1989 or 1990, I believe. I told them this interface sucks. And they said, why didn't you do it for us in that case? So I redesigned the UX for a, a software called Imprint. It's a multilingual uh, public, like a page maker. It's a multilingual software for them in Arabic, Urdu, Indian languages, and all kinds of things. Very cutting edge, I must say, for the time. So I did the UX for them. So there's a couple of projects I did. Uh, and then I got the research fellowship for Delft and went there from there. So that was the in between period. <laughs> superb, superb. I mean, there's a lot of different things in your experience. I think this is absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Just have time for one last question. Uh, Bourbon. Hi, Rekhu. Uh, it's Hi, great Bourbon. to connect with you and then great to... <laughs> Lovely. Devi, um, I don't have any specific questions, but maybe one or two comments I would love to make it. Um, Rekhu, it's great to listen to your presentation. And um, can I tell you a small story very quickly? I will be very brief. Rehu has this amazing please, please. Yeah. ability to cut through noise and cut through complex issues. Um, one good example is while you are studying, I remember all your colleagues were spending week long sleepless nights and working through the weekend. And then you just finished on a Friday night um, one particular design. And that design, everyone else is creating exquisite um, graphic artworks. And you created a single question mark on a big poster. And uh, that's filled with narratives of what that particular project brief was responding to. And you went for cycling during the weekend. So, <laughs> and then you scored the highest mark in that particular project. So, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that. Um, that attitude that you showed in 86 or 88 at IDC, and I can see through that all your presentations, all your project works. So it was exquisite to see that at that particular stage, and then it, it, it's, it's seen that it's been reflected in it. Rekha, one or two more points. Um, when you speak about it, that what is connecting your work through across different projects, and I would love to add probably two or three more words to it. One is that you are an exceptionally strategic thinker, and you're an innovator, and you're also a system thinker. And I can see that reflection in all those projects that you presented through. Um, and I can probably discuss in detail about that on, on, a, on a deeper level. Um, one, one more last point that I wanted to make it is, and this probably I will differ with you, that I don't see the designer as one more cog in the wheel of a client and a consultant and uh, 20 other, other, other professionals in that group. I still think he may not be on top of that pedestal, but still he is an innovative, life-giving professional who has got a greater role to play, not like any other technocrat, but he has good ability to think and think through. I mean, so that's exactly what you have shown it. So I don't want to bring the designer down and put him on the street level. I would definitely put him slightly elevated from the rest of the professionals. <laughs> Thanks, Rigo. Thank you. Thank you, Baban. Uh, I think the Thank trick you. is this, to have hobbies like cycling on the weekend, so you have to finish the work. <laughs> There's no other reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I can't help but uh, give Rigo the last question. Sorry. The hand has... uh, yeah. I can yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Raghu, I am also Raghu. I am three years senior to you, 85 batch. In fact, uh, you may be knowing uh, Rama, was yeah. my wife. Yes, Rama. And it was Rama. the first batch of uh, yeah. Rama Brahmanya. Rama, first batch of uh, VC, I Yes, yes, I do remember. Yes, very yes. Yeah. yeah. So I am Raghu and Rama. <laughs> so, uh, it was very, very interesting of a multidisciplinary experience and you've just thrown across and in fact, 
uh, today i've just shared this link to some of my pd students here in the university i think they have also joined here you know very very interesting very motivating and uh, the best part uh, i liked was the how you just connected all these thread your experiences with those words and user centric i you know i think uh, for any designer i think that's a key thing but mm, it's a what well, i just wanted to know more about uh, this leapfrog do they have uh, any kind of uh, office here in india or uh, uh, how do they choose uh, a product or a innovation or a company to invest on this investment company? Uh, no, we, there's no office in India, really not yet. It's a global company with offices in London, Sydney, um, Singapore, Nairobi, and other places. But our teams, we do have a lot of investments in India, firstly. And secondly, the comp companies, I mean, uh, Leafroll does not choose product, we only invest in companies. There's a whole different uh, uh, standard criteria for choosing companies. About one or two out of 100 companies get selected for funding, which is about somewhere from 30 million to about 70 to 80 million dollars for each investment. That is a growth stage companies. There's a lot of strict criteria about you know, how to do we, the complex process of analyzing your team of analysts, doing a number of factors to see that the products, the management, the financial soundness, the growth trajectory, and most important for us is, is to really provide the social impact that we want to do besides giving financial returns. So a lot of criteria goes into that. It's not a simple yes or no based on a few things. And often it can take uh, months to decide, it can take a process, can take anywhere from two to three months to even one and a half years to invest in a company through a number of, we do extensive reports and diligence, spending a you know, whole army of consultants working to get the data from the company, analyze it, and to make choices. Good. Um, I think I fully agree with the, what Bobbin has commented with a nice nostalgic memories of, you know, you are more a strategic thinker and a system thinker. And most of your project, when we just see, uh, you are only talking of a framework, 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 and everything. So do you think down the line in this digital age, these kind of a frameworks can be put into some kind of an artificial intelligence for them to, you know, give the results that you just key in. And do you think that is there any kind of a scope, such kind of a work of a designer uh, where this framework can be put into some kind of a backend support system or a software that where it could do, you know, add value to the business or the corporate or the company? Why? What does it bring? You know? So AI is a tool, you know, <clears throat> so we want to automate something. There's always a reason for automating something, right? There's a benefit of automating. Either you do it at a certain scale, reduce the cost, something. Just because you can automate something doesn't mean you have to do it. So if it makes sense, it will be done, of course. It might be done in some specific areas where, because automation requires deterministic rules to be able to do that. If it can't follow rules, then it's very difficult to automate. So the so-called framework concepts, any of this high-level strategic work we're talking about, if uh, it's a number of its, it's works on deterministic rules, yes, absolutely can be automated, and maybe it'll be automated along the way. But usually, if it's the things that can't be automated, which are people-centric, uh, that's what that remain manual process. That's why the strategy still remains manual process so far. But there could be some aspects of it in the future that might be automated. But uh, my question is always, if you want to do something, why? Mm. Good. Uh, I would like to uh, get your mail ID. Maybe sometime down the line, we can just invite you for some function when you are here in India or wherever you are that I would like to get in touch with you. Thank you so much. It was a great session. Wonderful. Though there is thank a very you. less audience thank today, but all it was some new faces. And thank you very much, Ravi, for really, really being passionate and organizing this. I see the value of this. Thank you again so much and happy to be in touch with any of you over linkedin that's the best way to reach me yeah i mean on behalf of the group we thank you to you very very interesting session i'm sure there's going to be a lot of video tomorrow thanks ravi nimish for organizing this and more importantly uh,
those who have returned to ask your question, please post it in the forum. We'll, uh, make sure that these questions reach Raghu, and I'm sure Raghu will take his time and answer them. Uh, sorry to take about 10 minutes past our usual closing time because we I just want to make up for some time we lost, and I'm sure it's uh, worth every <laughs> every minute of extension. And uh, I wish Raghu all the best on his current uh, role and uh, want to see you more often in our forum. And uh, those of you who attended, a big thank you to all of you to take your time to be part of this. And uh, we'll see you soon next week with the next session. And with that, good night to everybody and have a great rest of the week. And I'm now closing the recording. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Ravi. Thanks, Raghu.
Raghu, uh, we are having some uh, issues with your voice. Uh, maybe you could uh, put the video uh, off and then just keep your. That might help. Maybe it's okay, through the bandwidth. Um, you could keep your video yeah. off and then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Get the screen back here. Right. Okay. So uh, we are having some uh, issues with your voice. Uh, maybe you could uh, put the video uh, off and then just keep your. That might help. Maybe it's okay, through the bandwidth. Try. Um, you could keep your video yeah. off and then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Get the screen back here. Right. Okay. So,
I've, I've lost audio, is that mean, Amon? Uh, we all have lost it. He lost you, Raghu. I think he'll join in. Yeah, he's joining back. He's joining back. He had some disconnection happened. He's joining back. You may, uh, Regu, you need to un uh, unmute. Yeah, hi, apologies, something more distant. So right. my screen is, looks like my screen is off. That's fine, you, you could just. Uh... Okay, let me get my screen back as well.
Okay, I'm going to try it. Are you able to see my screen now? Yes, there is a bit of echo. You may want to check on that. Yeah, it's okay now? Yeah, 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 